You are now listening to Vigilantes Radio, presented by the only one media group. This is the people's choice for quality interviews, celebrities, and special guests. Hosted by Demetrius Dinny Reynolds. Call in to join the mix at 701-801-9813. For the complete archive of episodes, visit onlyonemediagroup.com and be sure to like us on Facebook at Vigilantes Radio. We welcome all. Enjoy the show. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your host, Demetrius Houdini Black Reynolds. Enjoy the show. Hello, what is going on? And welcome to another awesome episode of Vigilantes Radio. I'm your host, Denny Mussolini. And right now, guys, there's over 25,000 of you guys on our phone lines in the chat room. Um, using Google Hangout, Skype, or the browser, all the plugins that we use to run these live episodes. You guys are filling them up, and I appreciate that greatly. We have a very special guest, um, so you definitely want to stick around for that. There is a world of difference um, between someone who really cares and someone who is just going through the motions. When you deal with someone who truly, sincerely cares about what they're doing, it is obvious right away. Whether it is brain surgery, selling tires, cooking a meal, designing a computer, or presenting a business opportunity, the person who is committed to providing the true value will always do a better job. Someone who is simply going through the motions might be able to get by for a while, but will eventually run into an obstacle that his or her superficial programming (laughs) is unable to overcome. If you're not sincere in what you do, then you're under the um, control of someone or something other than yourself. When you are sincere, you put your best of yourself into your work, and that is a proven path to success. Find a way to care. Find a way to be truly sincere. It will make all the difference in the world. Take that from me, Dini Mussolini. That is my word, and word is bond. You're live in the mix. Let's get this started. Yo, hello and welcome to another awesome episode of Inside the Music or Inside the Book, Inside the Business, where we dive into the minds of the people who create marvelous things. It feels so good to be back with you guys once again. So one time, one time for my people who are indigos, crystalline or star seeds, or for my vigilantes audience family. And two times for my people who are vegetarian or vegans. If you're like me, we are averaging over 37,000 live listeners and we've been at this for four solid years. I appreciate all you guys who've been rocking with the kid on this journey and we're still evolving, baby. It is all because of you, most definitely. We are the people who have dedicated their lives to music, spirituality, business, literature, art, movies, and research in every aspect. And we want to allow you an opportunity opportunity to tell your story man we've had celebrities on our show from grammy award winning artists to nominees to actors comedians ceos technology geniuses visual artists from authors to professors and aliens or people think they're aliens it doesn't matter who you are or where you come from come on our show and talk to me so check it out to book your interview or just to share a real cool story email me at v radio at only one media group.com and that's v as in victor i'm passionate about what i do just as passionate about what you do and together Yes, together, we can get your voice heard by the people who should hear it. So let's create something incredible. You know the number to dial. 701-801-9813. 
text that number to your buddy right now and tell them to tune in to connect with us or our guests or you can hop in the mix directly from our website only one media group.com right from the home page you can slap that go live button and you'll be right here live in the mix and in the chat room with all of us feel free to shoot over some questions to ask our guests while they got here but only as time permits sometimes my guests and i talk entirely too much and we take up the entire hour and as always all episodes are available for free download and you can grab that from either spricker.com forward slash only one media group itunes youtube or any app from the google play or itunes store or over at our website and that goes for every single episode that we ever aired Full of change. I worked a full day. Now we're off to do some play. Got my partner in crime sitting next to me, and we'll find double trouble most willingly. There's a guy right inside that always brings good cheer. Called Discount Tobacco and Beer. Discount Tobacco and Beer. We got good heart And the bright yellow sign Gets us off to a good start We're seeing the same store clerk At the same time each day Got a bottle in a brown bag Now we're on our way Discount tobacco and beer guys well today's interview is the amory Picerno, uh interview and again i'm your host uh denny mussolini you just got finished listening to discount tobacco and beer my kind of song right no <laughs> oh, most definitely so our interviews go beyond the music and into the minds of the artists bands that created from researching our special invited guest mining for details and listening to everything we can our interviews are designed to bring out the best answers possible through provoking questions that have real substance. A sincere warm welcome to Anne-Marie Picarno to our show tonight. We'll have an absolutely amazing time talking with her about her life, her singles, 
and mindset. So guys, with that, let's go ahead and welcome her to the show. Hello, you're now live in the midst with all of us. How's it going? Howdy, howdy, howdy. Thank you for having me. Now, it is pronounced Paserno, but uh, over there, maybe in Italy, they say Picerno. Ah. And I've heard Picerno and Picarini and every other <laughs> combination <laughs> of it. But it is Italian, and marie Picerno. And nice. uh, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited. And we are excited to have you as well. Um, it is very nice to meet you uh, once again. Um, I, I had somebody on the show before, and they um, pronounced your name, so that's where I got it from. I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Cool. I'm used yeah. to it. <laughs> she's coming on the show I'm later. Used so to it. Thanks for that. Uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah. um, so I guess that's where we should start. Um, who are you, and where are you now in your music career? Well, uh, you know, I've been doing this a long time. I was, you know, hooked from the age of five and from my teen years, got very involved in theater and music and traveling and bands and comedy and live performance and songwriting. I, you know, picked up a guitar probably at age five and keyboard to piano and uh, was very inspired by a lot of teachers in my youth as a, as a kid and really wanted to, you know, just entertain and be a performer. I always wrote stories and songs and sang. So I've traveled extensively from the West out in Arizona to Colorado to Florida in the beginnings of my professional career as an entertainer and also comedian and not only musician and actor. So pretty much they call that gigging. You know, I, I consider myself an entertainer. I don't just say I'm a songwriter or I'm a singer or I'm this or that, because really, if you are an entertainer, you're going to embrace all forms of entertaining. And depending on where you're at in your journey, uh, for me, it's self-discovery and just really expressing myself, trying to put things in my performances that talk about my life and personal experiences. And I've started culminating these into a story um, that I'm telling, you know, through my performances. So um, I call myself an entertainer. I'm currently in Nashville and been out here about seven years, moved out here with a car and all my belongings, didn't know a single soul. Oh, wow. Yeah, kind of scary, but I don't know. You know, I, I look at it now when I'm here and I'm like, my gosh, how did I do that? And I honestly... When I made that choice, I had been in Florida 20 years and I had done so much live theater and bands and cruise ships and performing and I felt like my creative part was starting to die a little bit because when you do a band five nights a week, I like to stretch and do a lot of new material and I felt a little stifled so I said, where can I go that will inspire me and get some of my original and, and kind of start getting my voice back and so the choices were New York, Nashville, Las Vegas and of course California and mm -hmm. I thought Nashville that's you know let, let's check it out and I don't regret it at all because I've met so many wonderful musicians and artists and it's just you could go out any night of the week in Nashville and see incredible musicians and some may never ever be rich and famous and yet you see the most phenomenal talents and they're not only inspiring but they're good people and um i i, I really feel like it's changed my whole life as far as getting my original music out there okay nice so wow i could imagine that transition and, you know the feelings of going from one place to another not knowing a soul um like since you made the move how how soon did you get started um back into music once you made that move um well it was pretty immediate because i started going out to songwriter nights and playing and performing and developing i hadn't really um 
Well, I played in a little duo, but primarily I was a singer in all the bands and shows I was in. I never mm -hmm. considered myself a professional guitarist, you know, so I'd go out to the songwriter nights and plunk away on a 30-something-year-old Washburn guitar, which has written every song I've ever put on radio. But um, I started meeting other songwriters and musicians. I got detoured a little bit by... Uh, you know, you find out very quickly in Nashville, there's a lot of people that couch surf, a lot of musicians that uh, will live off of other people, and I'm a pretty generous, kind person. I've let a lot of homeless musicians and stragglers, I guess, you know, stay at my place and help get them on track. But then I also realized that that was stifling me a little bit, and I got real serious and started researching and reading about getting my music to radio and learning more about music publishing and licensing and mm -hmm. uh, I would honestly say after my first three years then I really started getting the airplay and recognition and starting to get awards whether it was songwriting or performing and just getting into the Nashville scene of being recognized as an entertainer and I really, uh, you know, a lot of people want to put a label on your music, your genre, and that was always the toughest thing for me because my first couple releases were pop rock with the Bad Girl EP, and um, people said, you're not country, and it's like, I never said I was country, I'm an entertainer. Uh, if you look at some of the greatest divas in the world, you know, whether it's Bette Midler, Cher, uh, even Bonnie Raitt has crossed over, Cheryl Crow, Dolly Parton is phenomenal. She's country, but man, does she have some gospel hits. She has written so many pop songs that other artists have uh, recorded, right? So, you know, when I look at it, I've mixed genres. So I started getting into American Roots, where mm -hmm. I was taking the instruments, whether it was banjo, mandolin, steel guitar, you know, and bass, piano, drums, all that. But keeping that real authentic sound of what you would hear if you heard it live, as far as my recordings in studio. But my voice has, I don't know, I honestly don't know who I would compare my voice to, because I grew up on Whitney Houston, Etta James, Aretha Franklin, Donna Summer, Patti LaBelle, uh, Anita Baker. Those six right there, is like, I, I knew everything inside and out. And then Celine Dion, Barbara Streisand, Bette Midler, Cher. And I also did a lot of these impersonations, Janis Joplin. And so I was influenced by all of them. So when you're in a city that's known for country, and then I'd be taking those sounds, but starting maybe country, but then mixing in some pop and rock. And But I still wouldn't call my American Roots music um, like commercial country of what you're hearing, all this pop rap stuff that they're claiming is country, because it's still really country with the instrumentations. Uh, but then my voice is bluesy and... It can be classical. I can do uh, Patsy Cline and the very traditional country, but it, it kind of bores me vocally. I like to play with my voice. I like to start simple. Usually it, the songs I write will start with a simple theme in the beginning, and then I'll tie in maybe rounds of different themes, and then I always like to go up into my higher register or soul and and play with notes that aren't the predictable notes. That's the only way I can describe it. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about your song, Bonfire. Um, what was the inspiration behind this song? Oh, wow. A lot of history in that song, and it did very well on radio. Uh, Bonfire started in a Facebook chat, believe it or not, with a very kind, very great friend of radio station owner Gene D. Piero of Hamilton Radio and he really wanted to help indies and we had a close relationship, played my music all the time and he said, I really want to help you and you know, why don't you write a song to inspired about people coming together and you know, with 
independent music and I had had a serious accident um, and without you know long story short had like a blackout a vertigo blackout and injured basically broke my nose fractured my jaw injured my neck I was a mess it's two and a half years later and you know I had two surgeries straighten out my nose and that was an Italian thing anyway that <laughs> I really did a number on myself so we were chatting about inspiring people and helping people and how our histories and our pain and our suffering you know can somehow be translated into being selfless ourselves and letting go of our fears and regrets and reaching out to others and how that love would heal us and I took a lot of that conversation and chat and stuck it in my notepad on my computer and he said bonfire and he goes it's burning in me I, you know he goes I just want to help and so these lines of some things that he said were the beginnings of this song that I structured into the chorus um, he said you're the right one to come along and there's no accidents in life and you know and these lines that he said became the lyrics and then to take it a step further I researched the history of bonfires and, and really found a wealth of information that got into the chorus of there were celebrations, there were festivals of lights, there were traditions, uh, bonfires, everything from the bad to wars and burning bodies to people letting go of their fears and regrets, sitting with a single guitar, telling their stories and sharing their music and others joining in with their voices and instruments and feelings of love and desire and you know the spark swirling and everything from the his historical cultures and celebrations and festivals that bonfires represented to independent artists and that burning in them to have a voice and share their music in a real tough music business so then I took it a step further and as the song was written and I brought it into the studio I realized this can't be a solo song this has to be a song with other voices on it and so on the recording day I invited several independent artists that I respected that are wonderful musicians in their own right to come in and I assigned each one of them different lines that I felt represented their own personal journeys and stories and they sang on the chorus or individual solo parts and you know uh, Lisa Coppola, Jamie Parker, Benny Pitzinger, Steve Owen and Donna Jo that wonderful gospel voice at the end and we all bonded it was such a beautiful day and so it all came together in that progression so naturally and it did very well still is being played on radio and bongo boy records and won a josie music award last year for best musical collaboration and the highest honor for me was being accepted on first ballot for the 61st grammy awards because i had just become a grammy member so to even have them accept my music for consideration was wonderful for me so that song just really i think was the highlight so far of my journey here in nashville okay that's a lot so, of information um, I know. <laughs> yeah <laughs> but it's dope i could probably dope. keep you um, on the line for hours because you know, uh <laughs> it's uh, you know when you're a musician you pretty much, you know, have to be open to everything and anything. And you certainly travel through the depths of war to all hell and back, you know, to get music out there. But on the journey, you certainly meet wonderful, wonderful people, too. Most definitely. So, Amory, let's talk about that moment in time that you saw something or, or saw someone or heard something, you know, for the first time that made you want to decide that music was something that you needed to do for the rest of your life. So can you tell us about that moment in time, who it was, where it was, and why it made such an impact on your life? That, that's a tough one because 
like it's all a layering of all these personal experiences but I mean the most distinctive memory that I have started all the way back to kindergarten where it almost was Mm. like an out of body experience because I felt like I was floating you know above above the auditorium looking down at the stage I was at the back of the auditorium and I was seeing myself there on the stage and I don't know how that's possible this is kindergarten before there's not a video it was before internet um, but I was that little five-year-old at the kindergarten graduation where they made like this daisy flower thing for me with the hole in the middle and my face was through the hole and I was singing a song and I will never forget it but yet it felt like that above the operating table or out-of-body experience that I was seeing myself you know it's still a memory and so vivid and I was hooked from that moment um, with the music and I saw a live performance of Patti the Bell probably when I was about I want to say 12 and I mean the lady is phenomenal and still is even to this day and I was just very inspired by her and uh, you know back as I was growing up the vinyl albums of all those icons I mentioned I just fell in love with music and I just knew, and and I'll add that uh, my parents, they didn't support my music. They thought I was wasting my time, but I was like a very shy, dreamy child that would run home from school to play the piano and write songs and write stories and play my guitar. And um, it's something that you can't just say no to. If it's part of you, it is part of your life, no matter what the challenge is. So I just continued to keep learning, performing, went to college to study musical theater and my first professional job, I would say those that was a big influence just as far as realizing, wow, I'm actually doing this and getting paid. So when I graduated from college, I was in a, like a 20-year professional repertory theater and I was, I would say, the novice, right? I was green. I was there with veterans that had been doing this for 20 years and boom, there I was and I always felt that way my first 10, 15 years of all this because every new opportunity I jumped in would be these ex- uh, experienced actors and performers and singers that, and I knew, I just, and I would do things that be, oh, you can't do that because, you know, he's a veteran. You can't upstage him. <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> I would throw myself into so I was continually learning and went on to Disney World, same same thing I was thrown into a comedy troupe improvisation boom and there I was and I was actually there with Wayne Brady who is now on television right let's make a deal and was there with uh, Drew Carey or Drew is it Drew uh, ah, yeah it's Drew Carey I believe the comedian and um, you know some of these people I work with are now on television it's like my gosh I should have touch them more but we were just like 20 year old actors working at Disney World and doing our six shows a week and um, I kept learning and incorporating every single thing I learned I would try and put into the next thing going from comedy to theater to music to bands to writing and I just steadily started creating my own style of what I wanted to put out that were actually my words and music Most definitely. Okay. Now, would you be um, would you consider your music to be art? Oh, absolutely. I would say that I wouldn't exactly call myself mainstream. Um, I don't know who I would particularly sound like because it really depends on the song. But one thing that you may notice with lyrics, the song you played, "Discount Tobacco and Beer," for example. Now, that's a fun one. That's meant to be funny and playful and loose, and but it's got a lot of those different sounds of country, Americana, rock, root, and then you can go to blues and soul at the end. But um, typically my lyrics, especially on serious songs like Bonfire or I Don't Know What Love Is or Rain, I 
I might have like happy sounding music or closer, for example, about a long distance relationship uh, and happy and kind of grooving beats. But if you listen to the lyrics, some of them are very dark or very um, serious themed songs. And when I write, I always usually write in double metaphors um, and try and incorporate the hidden message, the real message. So it may fool the listener at first if they're just looking or listening to, say, the, the commercial output of it. But then if you really start listening, you hear what the song is really about. And that's always been a trademark of mine. Even with Bad Girl, the pop rock song that I put out, I like witticism. I like if it's going to be sexy, it's always going to be tastefully sexy, sexy and playful with um, maybe the connotation of, you know, fun and naughtiness, just like I did a duet, Trouble. And that I wanted to put a lot of humor in. And, and that was the appeal of that song is that people were like, oh, my gosh, the, not only is the music great and it was traditional country, but it made people laugh. And I was going for that old school country. So my style, I think people are finally starting to get it after seven years here in Nashville. Because when I first entered on the scene, they wanted to label me bad girl, pop rock. And then they, then I put out kind of a bluesy country. And they were like, oh, wow. And then I put out a ballad. And my voice is... Uh, that I sing with all depend on the song and that comes from a lot of my theater background is what is this song about who is singing this song it might not necessarily be me the the voice that you hear in the song might be the person telling the story which is a character in my mind so they may sound different on bad girl than they do on I don't know what love is or trouble or discount tobacco and beer so i try and put the emotion mm -hmm. and the character and the personality of what that song is about in the tone of my voice that is the only way i can describe it and i do love all kinds of music so i you know play of course with the vocal melodies and um i have a sensitive side to my voice i have a loud rocking side to my voice and I have a you know a belt voice that people go wow my gosh you know mm -hmm. that bad for a white girl you know uh, because some people actually thought that you know like I was a Motown singer on some of my original works 10-15 years ago and then they meet me and they go my gosh you know you don't look anything like what you sound and it's like well it really depends on the song um, but I had a great great teachers and I do think it's important about the interpretation because you get a lot of songs in Nashville that they record the song you can hear all that auto tune and if you see them live they never sound like what they're recording is they can't because they got these little bitty voices and they don't breathe or support and so um, I really learned how to sing in a 2,000 seat theater and put my voice over to that back wall, which is, you know, the boom, mock, boom mics across the top of the stage and hear your voice come off that back wall, 2,000 seat theater and my vocal training in college and doing professionally. Uh, what you hear on any of my radio recordings is what you would hear if I sang live. Mm -hmm. That's dope. Um, so you kind of capture the same, uh, I guess you say energy or uh, performance as I, in the studio yeah, as well as. I would say it's true to, you know, you don't need auto tune. You'll never, ever see or hear me lip sync. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I think that's the most ridiculous thing in the world. I know that's important to. <laughs> Okay, videos, you know, everybody that puts out music videos, um, you know, they, they, there's always got to be lip syncing, but some of the most phenomenal 
music videos that I have watched that have kept my attention. Because first of all, I, I cannot stand. I see a band in a cornfield with the fire going up in the back, and I'm like, how did they get electricity out there to the cornfield? You know, <laughs> and stuff like that. Right. And it's just so unimaginative, in my opinion. And I'm very critical, but hey, I've been doing this for years with teachers that poked and prodded me, and you know, taught me just even the very minute movement with your finger, how the flow of that movement had some sort of meaning or else it was meaningless. So every movement, gesture, eye blink, whatever had to mean something as part of your character and your presentation. So you know, I watch fans that do these formula music videos. I just you know, but then I see some that are phenomenal. Yes, they'll put a little bit of that lip syncing in, but they will have a story and it really tells. It's just to me, some of them are just phenomenal art because mm -hmm. you, you really do want to cry or you see the acting and you feel that they really put thought behind the story in their video to really show what their song was about. And those are my favorites to watch. And I haven't yet. Yeah put out music videos that is my goal for this year um the the way that i've been working on is to get people familiar with my music and now they're like wow we never know what she's going to do next you know i love the, how the djs and the radio stations get excited because they're like oh my gosh you got another single coming we can't wait right. because each time i put the next one out it's like oh my gosh this is totally different than this or that and because I kind of mix the sounds, it does cross over to multiple genres. It will be on country, but it will also go on adult contemporary or go out to Australia or go in the UK or Canada. And it crosses over. And that's always been my goal is to keep it right in a certain range of unpredictability. But yet they know that it's got all those sounds in it. Um, but the music video, in my mind, uh, what I described as far as how I would like to interpret my songs, I've, my album, Songs from Nashville, is basically the story of my life, and I've got a lot of stories. I mean, I've met drug addicts, alcoholics, abusive relationships, terrible accidents, trauma, sleeping on the floor, eating eggs and tuna so you can't make it, so you can pay for music, you know, gigging and disappointments and rejection. And these songs I have been putting out the last seven years are really telling my story, which I've got maybe three more to go before the album's complete, but I've been releasing each one as a single. And then the album will be out there and then the videos and the bucket list is a live performance show that has the script and the actors and is telling my story with my original music and the choreography with the dancers and I can see it all laid out and that will take every single thing so far that I've learned as an entertainer put into my live show and then bucket list the show you know video to TV and possibly on tour so you never say never because it's all progressively happening and I just try and be patient and then just keep putting it out there <clears throat> so just uh, you know I figure I'll be doing this till the day I die so um, my story will be complete all the way to the final song you know mm -hmm. and I mean not like I plan on kicking off anytime soon but um, I'm hoping that that show will you know come to fruition before I do pass um, I've actually told people man if, I, if anything ever happened to me you know you need to contact my producer and get some of these unreleased songs because I'm not putting them all out at one time I'm you know three to six months before the next to next and uh but once the album is complete my goal is to do the to do the live show and the videos that tell the story and the songs most definitely 
Um, by that same token, Amory, is all music considered art? I mean, we know a bunch of crappy songs <laughs> that have made it into <laughs> the industry, um, whether it was mainstream or independent. And we've seen some crappy music videos as well. Um, I don't know. You tell me. Is, is all music considered art? Uh, absolutely not. Well, let's put it this way. I, I, I never just credit the little guy. I'll just give you my philosophy on that real quick. The little guy. We're talking even though there's a little indie radio station or some little singer with a guitar that sings badly out of tune on Facebook. And I don't think you should ever put down anybody that expresses their voice. We're all different. We're all unique. We come from many different cultures, backgrounds, ethnic religions. You know, we go on and on. Uh, so there's the diversity in that. And we cannot judge anybody that wants to, I don't care if it's the crappiest, you know, song performance. Um, if they're expressing themselves, it's what makes them happy. And we should never discredit anybody's, you know, ability or the need to, you know, show that creative. That's something that is totally unique to them, right? So. Now, of course, some people are better than others, and some pursue it professionally. So as you get into it professionally, money, of course, is always a huge, huge factor on whether somebody makes it to Billboard or mainstream radio or FM or television or movies, and also just being smart. Now, I feel like I'm like right below the glass ceiling right now. I uh, have done several projects with Bongo Boy Records, who has been an incredible support to me. Um, you retain all your rights to all your music um, as an independent artist, but she's so supportive to help you get the content out to whether it's TV or radio or magazine reviews and, you know, goes over and above to help you. at such reasonable promotional costs. Grand Royale Music Awards is another great venue that, is supportive to help artists and Josie Music Awards and all these internet radio stations that help us. So it all depends on where you fall in financially when you get to the FM radio spectrum. Mm -hmm. It's about money. It is called commercial radio for a reason. So I, I just now have another single that I've been like exploring, well, what are the costs to get the billboard to FM? And I'm like, my gosh, I'm being quoted 5000 mm. 10000 yeah. 20000 50000 And I'm like, well, what do you get? Can you put that in writing? And it's amazing, mm -hmm. especially here in Nashville with all the sharks, of what people will call your phone as soon as you say you're into They're just trying to get your money. Now, what are they going to do after they get your money? And so the, the people that... Um, are on FM radio, they paid minimally, probably, I'd say minimally, that are probably at least 50000 to to 100000 And that's for all the PR, the marketing, to actually have a song plugger that's calling the radio stations and the ads. And But um, if you're an independent like myself, maybe you got to spend at least... 10,000 to at least get to some FM radio, but it's really about relationships as well, because I don't have $10,000, so what I have always, and that's part of me just as a person, um, if I believe in you, and I have you in my life, whether it's radio show host, or TV, or a DJ, or you know, whatever I'm affiliated with, it's because I think you're a good person and you've got the right intent in your heart, whether you're big time, small time. And my belief is that the better relationships you keep and maintain professionally, as well as in your music affairs, those things fall in place. Um, and I share my success with my independent artist friends and I support the people that support me. And not a lot of artists, as far as from my perspective as an independent artist, do that. I mean, you have some people across mm -hmm. social media, they'll steal all your information. They'll steal every 
opportunity you post or this or that, but they will never acknowledge you or never support you or say, hey, congrats, because some people right. are just all about the climbing and climbing. I have helped not only a lot of radio stations grow, but I help Bongo Boy. I don't work for Bongo Boy Records, but I'm their I'm the cheerleader because I appreciate everything they've done for me. And, you know, uh, anybody that plays my music or has a show or is trying, you know, whether it's if I share across social media, but there's a lot of stuff I do behind the scenes. It might be... Uh, you tell me, hey, um, I'm trying to get on other radio stations. Oh, really, Demetrius? Um, you know, w- what are you looking for? And you might just mm-hmm. say that in casual conversation. Well, th- if something pops across my feed or I see something, hey, we're looking for this or that. You know, Demetrius mentioned that. Let me send him these web links. It might not have absolutely right. anything to do with me. I'll be like, hey, I just saw this. Here, check it out. It may be for you. Hey, right, it works yeah. great. And I do that for people all the time. Hey, I saw this. I thought of you. Here you go. It only takes hmm. a couple seconds, you know, to think of someone else and give them something maybe they didn't see. And then, of course, you know, people blow up my message box about how do I tag a MP3? Well, I'll tell you, trying to have a chat with somebody, how they put metadata in an MP3. Yeah. Wow. You don't want to do it, but I do that a lot. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I, I'm, like, chatting for, like, two hours of click here, click there. Then I get frustrated. Then I pick up the phone. Then I'm yelling at them on the phone. Okay, I'm going to go to the site with you. All right, click here. <laughs> and I do this. They annoy the hell out of me. But I do it because I love them, and I want them to learn. And I have had people do all these things I just mentioned for me. When I was young and green, when I was, how do I do this? And and they took the time to share their knowledge or share a resource, and, and that is what shaped me, you know, as the entertainer I am. So it's, and it's all in good karma and goodwill, and I firmly believe in it. You know, no matter what level you are, so. But I don't. I don't know a lot about you. Do you go by Dini, Houdini, Demetrius? I see the. <laughs> All the above. Depending on man. the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I noticed you got or double D in your name. Does that have any hidden me? <laughs> Demetrius Dini Reynolds. Uh. But I wondered where the Houdini Whoa. came from. If we can just interview you briefly here for a second. Where did the Houdini oh, come from? Oh, that is quite a story. Um, <laughs> so There's got to be one. The guy you see today, yeah. The guy you see today is not the guy who I was maybe 15, 20 years ago. So okay. um, a bit of a good old boy is what we used to call guys in the South. I'm from the South. And, uh, you know... Good old boys uh, don't mean any harm, but every now and then uh, the law doesn't chicken like Chicken in the bread pan, I'm picking up dough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was one of those guys, and um, I had some kind of superpower where I could just evade the police. So they began to mm-hmm. nickname me Houdini. I gotcha. <laughs> Who did it? So it kind of stuck. Houdini. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's always the question. Yeah. Who did it? wasn't who it wasn't who Dini. <laughs> but um, Dini, I just shorted it, uh, shortened the name for radio. Um, I was an artist once before, and uh, kind of wanted to separate the two um, for professional you gotcha. reasons. Well, yeah. and then that's my story. You know, I think we all have. I think we've all done things in our lives that we have been proud of, depending on the moment. Um, you know, you got people that bring out the best in you, and then sometimes you become friends with people that bring out the absolute worst in you. The absolute worst. Yeah, absolute and um, worst. You, you see, you know, everybody's got a dark side. Everybody's got a light side. Sometimes you meet in the middle. Sometimes things happen. And when I look back and think about certain things I've done, I've never been in jail or, you know, uh cause any like physical harm to anybody or anything like that i'm not a fighter per se but i look at things as oh, you know maybe i'm not exactly proud of that, <laughs> or that. and right. you know i never said i was perfect but um 
I look back and I wonder sometimes why I allowed myself to go down certain dark roads. But um, I think as we get older, we mellow out a little bit and we start realizing, because when we're in our 20s, we think we're indestructible. That and I always said, you know, my boobs are never going to sag. You know, oh, I got great. (laughs) It's like, okay, 20 years later. um, hmm, I remember saying that. But uh, anyway, it's like the things and the people, you go through different spells. I know I have some friends on Facebook I take the time to chat with that blow up my box that I know might be lonely. And, you know, I do it because I think everybody goes through certain downs and ups and when people are happy Mm -hmm. that's when they're not reaching out they're out they're busy they're running around they're partying they're singing they're involved with their relationship if they've got a boyfriend or girlfriend or married but then when things happen whether it's tragedies or accidents or just that that's i think when people really do a lot of self-reflection about well who are my real friends who was there for me when i was in the hospital or you know Mm -hmm broken an ankle a couple of years ago I was in an upstairs apartment in Nashville in the middle of winter I couldn't get anywhere I couldn't go anywhere I couldn't get to the store I couldn't drive you find out really fast who your real friends are um, you know in situations like that or who really cares about your emotional well-being hey I haven't seen you on Facebook in a while are, are you busy are you going through anything and I do the same I'll call people if I don't see or maybe I see a post or um, you know, unfortunately, social media is here to stay, and gone is the day before all this where you went next door and talked to your neighbor, and you knew who your neighbors are. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't even want to know who my neighbors are, <laughs> but I live in an apartment in Nashville, a little different environment. I don't want to know my neighbors. I don't want them to know my business. Right. So some of them will say, oh, I heard you singing, because sometimes I record. Uh you know, I try and put like the blanket over my head or whatever so I don't bother my neighbors. But sometimes I'll do radio liners and record some things in my for demos. But uh, mm-hmm. Nashville is kind of a tough place, so I kind of sequester myself away from the outside world because I feel like the older we get, the more protective we've got to be of our family oh, and yeah. our friends. And oh, you yeah. start realizing way we maybe grew up isn't the way kids are growing up today and it probably due to the news and social media that you see a lot more violence because I mean in my Mm -hmm. when I grew up I'm in my 50s when I grew up it was just the newspaper and maybe what you saw on television but they didn't show a lot of that on the news now it seems to be a news piece when you see people fighting in the grocery store and there's just so much anger in the world and I don't get it I write about it some um, but there's a lot of angry people you know I could go on and on but I don't get much in politics but I just feel um, you know we really need to start looking at people that need um, you know medical help and um, Mm -hmm education and uh, our world has become addicted to this hoopla you know around the violence and the negativity and there needs to be more positive things out there so the songs that I've been starting to put out the last couple have been happy songs more positive songs inspirational because I really start to feel that you mentioned bad videos and commercial music well yeah they bought that and you listen to it and it's all oh this mofo and you know all the profanity and Mm -hmm. how are our kids supposed to become warm loving people listening to all this crap because you're right it's crap right i don't want i mean there's a few little rap songs you hey that's kind of a cool little rap group and some rappers you know really good but as a rule i don't consider rap music um I like r and I like the pop and soul and all that. But why can't our messages be positive? Why can't they have mm-hmm. positive influence? So I really do think that's why kids these days are walking around with guns and knives. And, oh, you pissed me off. You uh, took, you drank my Coke, and then you hear they shot the person. Right? They got in a fight over right. this, so they shot him. And it's like, oh, my gosh. Is that really the solution? So um, I reflect a lot on the the way the world is now. So I'm kind of 
very protective of my friends and social circle and it translates over into my music and business so um, mm-hmm. I don't need to go, go to big parties or huge events and it's more about the quality these days for me most definitely same here Anne Marie alright I have one last question for you but before that I do want to play your track um, Bunfire so we'll play that and we'll be right back here it is guys it's Bunfire Many a story has been told round the bonfire. A fire of passion deep down inside. Regret and tears I cannot hide. But I have a fire burns round me. I've thrown in dreams, emotions fight Memories blaze to shed a light Bonfire ignites from within me Light up the night, celebration Festival of light is tradition Burning bright Back again, that was Anne Marie with her song Bonfire. 
I love that yeah, record. Yeah, what do you think of that? Um, <laughs> great sound. Now that yeah. you know the story <laughs> behind it, right? Of how those right, words yeah. came to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, that many a story has been told around the bonfire uh, that voice Benny Pitt singer great great storyteller country type songwriter uh, very funny older guy got that voice and he goes many a story has been told I'm like what's a toad (laughs) you're Alabama boy and Donna Jo at the end, right. that gospel voice, she's such a beautiful soul, man. You would love her music. That girl is like a Loretta Lynn, back Virginia Woods girl that just has the most beautiful voice. She does some awesome Facebook lives and sings for hours, and people just love her. And I met her personally. Wow. Um, and the girl kind of doing the duet with me, Lisa Coppola. She used to sing with Billy Joel on tour, and she's a beautiful friend. Oh, wow. We became very close after she came out to the studio. She actually flew out from New Jersey to come sing on it and helped me finance that song and that project. And Bob McGilpin, he did all the instruments and the tracks, and he has two songs on Billboard. I want to say Sexy Thing and Disco Queen. If you, if you Google... Bob McGilpin, you will come across videos of him performing in Paris or VH1, dancing around in gold lame and gold chunky disco shoes. <laughs> it's amazing that mm-hmm. he's my producer. Oh, he wow. helps us artists. And uh, Jimmy Parker, that that voice um, uh, in the beginning as well. You know, he lost his wife to cancer, and I try. I gave everybody lines that meant something to them emotionally the only way I can describe it and of mm-hmm. course that It's Burning in Me was Gene Piero's idea of the whole song Bonfire so it, it is one of my favorites so far that I've produced because it gave me lifeline you know lifetime friendships mm-hmm. and wonderful people in my life most definitely alright well Final question for you: um, A record like Bunfire, um, would you say, is a fair representation of what we can expect on a future project from you? Um, I would say it will, it will probably build from there, because that song was all about helping some independent artists get them recognized. Like, if you went to that song, say on my Spotify, the links all go to their music as well. And we did very well with that song on radio and, like I said, award shows and the Grammy first ballot last year. But now my next big project, it's kind of like Woody Allen. Oh, if you're in a Woody Allen film, you know, (laughs) in the day, you know, the big ensemble cast. So it was kind of like the We Are the World and Country, you know, Michael Jackson's hit. But now I have even a bigger project in mind that involves even more artists and reaching out now to Grammy members to get to that next level not to be superficial or anything but to get it to a wider audience because as an indie artist money wise and things you you, you can go so so far and if you get a lucky break you know and, and many do or it crosses over or somebody picks it up and so you have to be really diligent regardless and, uh, but to get to a higher level so I'm last year first time went out to LA to meet other Grammy members and also indie collaborative artists that are CMA and Grammy and you know it's a collective of independent artists and uh, really started making connections and so I have a song that's already written um, that I want to include even more artists than Bonfire on it and take it to an even higher level than that song um, and incorporate the Latin genre. So it's going to incorporate all those sounds you just heard plus some Latin influence. And that's the only way I can describe it at this point because I've learned being in Nashville to not ever post, publish, share your music unless somebody's got a written agreement even if you're just talking about working together because people will steal your ideas at a heartbeat. But uh, 
Hmm. I don't think anybody ever knows what they're going to expect, though, from me. They usually, at this point now, now I feel pressure, like, wow, this next one's got to be even better, or this or that. Uh, but mm -hmm. I, um, I'll sit on it. You know, I will put it out in good time uh, because I feel it's all about the quality at this point. I don't need to be spitting out a song every other month. I'm, I'm writing songs that, like I said, once I'm long gone, they'll still be there. They'll be remembered. And I actually think that some of my best work that is yet to come um, probably will be recognized after I'm dead and gone. Um, and that's the final song in my show about. Because once I produce that show I mentioned and my album's out and I've produced it and filmed it and go also to get it on some form of television. Um, my story will have been told and then it will be time to retire or just, you know, <laughs> make music but not have such a massive, but, but I'm wanting to get a certain story out there, I guess is the only way I can describe right. it. So people, now that they kind of know the theme of what the songs are, each one I've been even explaining across social media, well, here's the backstory on this song. You know, here's, here's how this song came to be. Because that's the toughest thing, I think, as an artist. You just want to put your music out there and have people, oh, that's great, and really like the music. But see, everybody wants to know every detail, right, behind the scenes and the hardest thing to release. If you're writing something from the most personal, tragic point, maybe, in your life, it's hard sometimes to be personal and put it out across social media because you got the trolls and you got negative people who like to... That's all you do. If you ever read news and you read the comments about tragedies and there's always some jackass and they're making a comment. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to put you're vulnerable to put this is your creative soul part of your being that you put out there in your music. But um I'm learning how to do that a little bit more. Um but I don't do it to exploit. It's I'm I'm staying very true and authentic to myself when I present work. So, for example, coming up Friday, August 30th, it's actually not an original tune, but I will be releasing a new single, I Will Always Love You, which is the Dolly Parton classic, and that's coming on Bongo Boy Records. And my interpretation of that song wasn't just to go for a traditional country. I kind of went more for a stripped-down acoustic with, like, say, guitar and mandolin predominantly and the vocal harmonies were the emphasis on my interpretation of that song and it actually when i was in the studio recording it is a dedication to a very close friend of well over 15 years that committed suicide a year ago august 3rd and that's how i interpreted my performance of that song um, a lot more history behind that, too, which it's hard to talk about, so I started with the song. And I guess as the song, you know, gains track, people hear it, I might tell more about how that happened. And um, it still affects me, you know, to this day. So I put a lot of love and emotion in that song performance. So Most definitely. you never know what you're going to hear next. Yeah, and I can't wait. Well, I thank you so much, Amory Persano. Is that right? Yeah, you got it. You got it, Houdini. You got it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I definitely appreciate your time uh, for spending with us and talking about your life and your music. I want to ride out yeah. to your last song, Bad Girl, before we invite our next guest on. All right. Well, that should rev people up, and I'll tell you real quick. That song is all about, we'll say, of age, naughty schoolgirl that's fantasizing about her teacher and uh, definitely brings you back down to the Motown, down to Summer Sounds. I really appreciate you having me on the air, by the way, and anybody that wants to check out my music, please do annemariepiserno.com, A-N-N-E-M-A-R-I-E, 
Picerno, P-I-C-E-R-N-O dot com. You'll find all my social media links. And thank you so much, Judy. Thank you so much, Amber. Come on, boy. School's out. And I wanna be sure to give my man enough I haven't done research as a should But you're giving me time to make it good The room is empty, the dark is locked We got book supplies and dark well stock We even have films on love's history But I'd rather you teach me Probably Vigilante's family, as always, for checking out my podcast over here at Vigilante's Radio. All episodes are available for free download, and you can grab that from either Spricker.com forward slash only one media group, iTunes, YouTube, any app that's on a Google Play or iTunes store, or our website. And that goes from every single episode that we've ever aired. If you'd like to request music or a particular guest or send something for me to play, email it to the radio at only one media group.com 
If it's music, please label it by artist and title. Here's my disclaimer. We are genre free. We do not judge and we absolutely do not base our opinions on hearsay, but facts alone. And actually, you can scratch all of that because all of my opinions are always right. That's the bottom line. This is my show. So deal with it. <laughs> nah, just kidding. On behalf of myself, Danny Mussolini, I appreciate all you guys for tuning in either afterwards or live with us. Spread the word because sharing is caring. We stepped up our game just for you guys and our guests to make sure that you have the best experience here on our show. Be sure to connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, as well as Spricker. We always follow back. That is the number one rule. Okay, well, just remember to be yourself and be absolutely great at just doing that. Avoid being too comfortable because you're messing with your potential when you do that. Peace and have a good night. And now listening to Vigilantes Radio, the people's choice for quality interviews, art, music, and hot topics. Hosted by Demetrius Houdini Black Reynolds of the duo No Longer The Hero. All episodes of this podcast are available for free download at www.onlyonemediagroup.com. This is a 7th Sign Regime Rebirth Worldwide Syndicate Exclusive.